the largest electrical site on planet Earth is the Three Gorges Dam in China. The Keystone Pipeline is a pipe about this wide. The Keystone Pipeline moves about 50 gigawatts of continuous power. So about two Three Gorges dams. Uh, nuclear waste is the safest form of waste. I mean, what would happen if China were to bomb yeah. whatever facility holds those, those inert pellets? Yeah. The largest electrical site on planet Earth is the Three Gorges Dam in China, right? So it's the largest concrete structure ever created by humans. Massive, massive hydroelectric dam in China. It has a nominal nameplate generation of about 22 gigawatts. In practicality, it makes about 17 gigawatts. Huge, huge energy facility. Um, and it, it distributes these through massive electrical cables that snake all throughout China. Um, we have a pipeline coming down from Canada called the Keystone Pipeline. The Keystone Pipeline is a pipe about this wide. It's standard steel, right, about that thick. Um, and you can calculate how much energy does that thing push. And you can, this is gonna be a chemical energy figure, not electrical, but it's basically the same thing, it's just energy. Um, the Keystone Pipeline moves about 50 gigawatts of continuous power. So about two Three Gorges dams, we can call it a Six Gorges dam if you want. Uh, two to three times the Three Gorges dam worth of power in a pipeline that's this big. Wow. So hydrocarbons are, are civilizational level technology. They, they are required to move energy between nations to power high energy density formats uh, to get to Mars, right? If we want to go to Mars, we're doing that with hydrocarbons, right? Starship is powered by methane, right? Which is a hydrocarbon. So there's, there's all of these use cases, which I think are very underappreciated. And we'll continue to use hydrocarbons for a very long time. You know, earlier also, we, we, had, we had talked about how Russia is influencing NGOs and, and lobbying firms and stuff about, you know, to, to create a narrative against nuclear. And so I'm curious, I mean, when it comes to energy, I mean, yeah. it's, obvious, it's obviously a very profitable business. Mm -hmm. And so when you are a threat to oil and gas, yeah. um, green energy, still, I mean, do you... Do you feel like you have narratives against you that are put on through them? I mean, I read something, I don't know, maybe about six months ago that said that, you remember the big power outage in Texas when yeah. they had that winter storm? Yep. Was that last year or two years yeah, ago? Two years ago, yeah, something like that. Um, you know, I had, we had all heard, you know, oh, it's because, you know, the solar panels were freezing and the, the wind turbines were freezing. Yep. What I actually read was that the pipelines yep. from gas yep. were freezing and the gas industry was was really on top of it and, and had created this narrative and pushed it out that it was oh the 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 wind turbines had froze and the solar panels had snow and shit on them and they yep. couldn't they couldn't produce and so so it was a if it was true which i don't know if it is then that's maybe you know was that true yeah no that's that's absolutely right the the freeze in texas was very related to, to gas yeah absolutely mm -hmm. there's temperature profiles where, where gas doesn't work as well, especially if you don't build it for that. And this was a very uncharacteristic event for Texas and it hadn't really been, been built for that yet. So it is true. Yeah. So, I mean, so right there, I mean, yeah. oil and gas was on on their game and pushed a narrative which which was an elute, yeah. it was a false false narrative yeah. that, that, was, that was, you know, that, that, that blamed yep. Yep. wind and solar. People, so is that happening to you? Are they, is oil and gas? Is is wind and solar? Are they are they pushing narratives out about nuclear to hinder your business? I think that industries will always sort of jockey against each other, and PR firms will always try to find ways to shift blame. Um, I do think that in the '80s, there's good evidence that the oil and gas industry, um, you know, funded some of the narratives against nuclear. Um, I put this in sort of like. I don't call it fair game. It's not something that I would do, but it's something you should expect in business. In business, you should expect counter narratives. Um, but you know, what's more interesting to me today is like how much of the physics is inevitable, because at the end of the day, you can only lie to people for so long. Mm -hmm. And I do think that people have been lied to about nuclear. And one of the reasons that I'm so excited to be building now is that we're building in the information age, right? So the fact that you discovered that narrative right, about what was happening in ERCOT is a product of the fact that we live in an age of the internet, 
right? So you, these narratives only last for so long uh, in an age when information travels at the speed of light and we all have X and we all have podcasts that we listen to and these sorts of things. So I think that uh, nuclear has been under this narrative burden coming from rivals and maybe oil and gas a little bit and maybe renewables and you know just various people who didn't want nuclear to happen. But the, the jig is up, right? You know, I think everybody's starting to recognize that nuclear is the cheapest and the safest and the cleanest form of power on earth, that it is gonna power our future. And also that the demand for energy is so enormous that I think it's kind of pushed away a lot of the competition uh, feeling between the gen generation sources. Like, listen guys, we need to triple the grid, right? Like th there's no boxing each other out. If you can get NACS on faster than I can get nuclear on, power to you, right? Um, we're all going as fast as we can and we're still not gonna be able to catch up to the actual demand for generation. So uh, I think there's a little bit more camaraderie than there was maybe 20, 30 years ago. You know, also when it comes to the the safety of nuclear, I mean, we had talked, I talked about this with uh, Scott Nolan as yeah. well, but you know, he was talking about, you take the, the, the seeds or whatever you call them and you put them in the concrete. You had just yeah. mentioned that, you know, something that didn't come to my mind uh, when I was interviewing Scott is, you know, what, what are some things that could happen? What if, I mean, China's obviously our biggest adversary at this mm. point. And so what would happen, you know, when you put those seeds or those pellets, pellets in, in, into concrete and bury them when they're, when they're obsolete? Yep. I mean, what would happen if China were to bomb yep. whatever facility holds those, those inert pellets? Yeah. So this is one of the things that they look at when they design these casks. They look at various kinetic events, they look at, Im look at impact events uh, and analyze that exact question, what would happen? And the short answer is that the amount of energy that you would need to actually cause a dispersal event, um, it's like, it's way more worth it to bomb something else, right? The, the outcome of that's like, yes, you could, you could put such a strong kinetic there that theoretically, if you kept bombing it, you could get through the concrete and you can get through the containment and then you can get through um, the, the triso-particle uh, ceramic itself. And now you've got some uh, fissile product dispersal and then you can map how that dispersal works. And in theory, you could imagine some people getting cancer and you know, probably not that many, right? Unless it's like stored in the center of New York City, which mm -hmm. is unlikely. But once you do all that math, you realize, well, if, with that or level of ordinance, it was, there are a lot more interesting targets to hit, right? Um, the outcome that you're gonna get from that is like not at all worth the amount of ordinance that you need to do gotcha. something like that. Um, not trying to give people ideas, but like, that's just not a, a very highly leveraged use of uh, a, a terrorist event, right? Um, the other thing is, of course, we have lots of safeguards and protections around uh, the nuclear fuel, right? And not just fences, but like armed security and these sorts of things. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think like the the nuclear waste concern has been highly overplayed. Uh, people have played it up to a degree that's that's just not commensurate with the facts um, because it's kind of the easiest target for nuclear, right? It, it sounds scary, like, oh, there's nuclear waste and people don't know what that means. But the fact is uh, nuclear waste is the safest form of waste of any power generation. No kidding. It's the safest. So if you even, if you look at, you know, I, I always hesitate to compare nuclear to oil and gas because I have a great deal of affection for oil and gas. I think that oil and gas has powered the modern world. We would not be anywhere close to where we are as a civilization without oil and gas. But it has downsides, right? It has, we may be farther if we had we gone with nuclear earlier. Absolutely, absolutely, we'd be farther if we had gone with nuclear earlier. But still, I am I have an enormous amount of gratitude for the oil and gas industry for powering humanity to this point. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.